I'm feeling the heat already from our brand new opening. Very nice. Very nice. Welcome back to our Friday fireside chats here at Question Pro. Took a few weeks off, uh, but now we've got a jam-packed uh, schedule over the next few weeks with some amazing guests. And today we've got a very special guest who's actually joined us here in person in Paddington in London at our office, Mike Brown, uh, who's had an extremely illustrious career in market research, 35 years in different operations roles um, between big agencies, small agencies, and is now running his own consultancy. And so we're really going to be able to get today a fantastic picture about how operations technology, research technology has changed over um, the, the kind of entire market research industry over the last 20, 30 years uh, and talk about where it's going. So I'm really excited to have Mike here in person. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me along. It's been Absolutely. really pleased to join the uh, Question Pro team here. I saw a couple of the other guys as well in the office on a Friday. Yeah. So it's always nice to be in a, a, an office setting because we don't do it so much these days. There's actually somebody here on a Friday. <laughs> I, I heard the surprise in your voice. You're like, wait, there's, I, I thought it might only... I mean, the rest of the office is pretty empty, but you know, at least we've got we've got some folks here. So, for those of you who um, probably rightly assume that in most places Friday is a work from home day, we do come into the office here at Question Pro, um, and that's even when we are doing half day uh, uh, summer Fridays too. So people are still coming in, which is good, <laughs> good to see. Mike, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your kind of journey, your history, your career? Where did it all start, and how did you kind of get to the point of uh, running Greenberg Consultants. Um, thanks, Steve. So, uh, like quite a lot of people, certainly in my era, um, and I'll just leave it at that in terms of time, um, kind of fell into market research. Mm -hmm. I did a mathematics based degree, uh, there were some computing elements to it. Looking for a job around back in the days, this was the mid 80s, so, you know, a long time ago. So, computers are great big things rather than smaller things. <laughs> and uh, and, and found an opportunity at uh, about a couple of miles from my home mm. in London, um, working for a market research agency on what was classified as data processing. In those okay. Days. Uh, kicked around two or three jobs in the first few years, um, ended up going back to that same office a few years later, got a bit more of a management responsibility, stayed on the data processing side and then got onto the data collection side mm. in the early 90s. Okay. So moving into the area where... So, so thinking back to these days, if we think about deliverables now, and people talk about dashboards, right. and real time and everything, real time for us in those days was things like bikes waiting downstairs mm -hmm. to pick up printed tables <laughs> to take them to a client in another part of London. Uh, as to getting them around the world, I don't know how we that, but, um, but we were a reasonably big organisation, so we had printers in our offices that could have had bikes there as well. Wow. So, so then the data collection side of things became, particularly at the time where we began to take things to, not online, but uh, assisted by computers. So okay. computer-assisted telephone into okay. computer-assisted personal into Right. So we had machines that we'd send out with field workers, went through a programme at one of the research agencies mm -hmm. in the early 90s where we would kind of kitted out 400 people around the UK. Wow. Uh, we had to have a support desk. We had to get the right software. So actually that leads into kind of where I am today and some mm -hmm. of the things I was doing. So we had a sort of discovery phase of what we actually needed from software. What, how, you know, which different packages we looked at uh, and then actually the implementation phase. And we kind of took about a year on that mm -hmm. to get the right kit in place and get it up and running. Um, and then sort of stayed on the operational side right through the mid-90s into the 2000s. The advent of online for me was around the year 2000. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a small independent co consultancy that I worked for at the time now called Cobalt Sky. Um, I'm sure some of the people who might watch this will know them. Uh, we got our own web server and started collecting data online. There was very, in the UK at that time, there was very little panel data. Mm -hmm. So there was a company called SSI, okay. you know, part of the you know the bigger organisations <laughs> and stuff. They, they had uh, some online panelists. You got it. Um, and then worked through to my most recent gig, which was Cantar, mm -hmm. which was kind of 2009 to 2019, where I became much more of a consultant. Mm -hmm. So working with research teams to try and kind of improve either a project level or more strategically on how we did our research, um, which took me up to 2019. And, and, and what can be a very horrible thing for some people, and that's made redundant. Um, which was a you know a tough time emotionally right at the time, but actually then gave me the opportunity to set up my own business after Amazing. all this time, yeah. kind of thing. So sometimes that's that's how I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it was a good time for me to start setting up my own business. 
I love it though. I mean, even just that background, it's it's one of those, especially people who are kind of newer in their careers in, in market research, um, to actually think about the history in that way, that actually there was these kind of very concrete ages that looked a lot different than today, right? Where, uh, you know, actually in order to do a study, you had people on bikes with loads of paper responses coming back to your office. And so that was data processing, right? That was data input. And then you move to this phase where everything is assisted, right? And you actually have to enable 400 people in the field to be going and walking and thinking about all the operations that comes with that, right? You've got to support those 400 people. You've got to think about data quality within those 400 people. How are we compensating and incentivizing those 400 people? How are we making sure they're not lying <laughs> and putting in fake interviews yeah. and all the systems that come with that? Then you go to this next stage where it's like, okay, we're starting to get into online surveys, but it's very much your own on-premise server. <laughs> You're almost building your own software. There's no online panels to plug into. You've got to handle distribution all on your own. Now to this age of, Hey, if I want to run a survey, we can actually get it done pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, we'll <laughs> light, up, light up the software and press the audience button. Hey, there's 300 responses back, and we know exactly what we're what we're talking about. So things have changed. And, and thinking about you know some of the more recent discussions we've been having in the last six months or so, uh, Mike Stevens into that platform, mm -hmm. you know, the whole area of synthetic. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so we're now even at the point where we're beginning to get surveys without real respondents. And right. that's all very quantitative. So certainly as, as anyone who knows me, you might read that, you know, my qualitative knowledge is very, very basic. Mm -hmm. I know some real experts in the field. But from a quant point of view, you're now looking at essentially surveys without surveys right. without partic real right. participants. Right. Right. So that's that's how far we come. Yeah. And that presents its own challenges. <clears throat> I want to actually want to stay on this topic of synthetic data. I mean I think again, you know, you've got such a great arc in terms of your perspective to see where we're going. We're starting to have some really interesting conversations internally about synthetic data and uh, and responses. What are your thoughts? Where do you see it being useful? Where do you see the challenges at the end? Of and, and maybe maybe start by saying what is it? Yes. Right? What is synthetic data? So so in, in, in broadest sense, you, you're kind of looking back, and again, this would go back to my early years. We were trying to work out with small sample sizes how we could get to bigger sample sizes. Mm -hmm. So we were beginning to create hybrid approaches where we'd have some data collected in one part, some data collected in another part from different groups of people, mm -hmm. and then using statistics to kind of join that all up. Mm. Now what we've got is we're sitting on quite a lot of data. Right. And, and it's using various machine learning skills, statistical analysis skills, and, and then getting into areas where we've used the broad term of AI mm -hmm. to begin to say, well, based on all this information, we kind of know what people's responses are to some extent, right. but we need to kind of query it on our template. So right. we're going to ask that data, our survey, to find out what that data thinks the yep. responses would be. Um, that it's it's still at early stages, and a lot of things. Again, you know, thinking about my time, that lots of things that come into the industry that have have seemingly failed. I mean, online mm -hmm. failed up front. Mm -hmm. There were so many people I worked with, including <laughs> myself probably, who, who at the time of online, it was, this is never going to work. Mm -hmm. This is never going to work. But then you have things like, well, hold on, the iPhone came out in right? 2007. Right. right. So I, I'm not, you know, again, I'm not sure, much as we've done so much validation on data, online data, comparing it to offline, uh, comparing it to general self-completion on paper, we've done so much work on it. But the tipping point, as well as price, because that had a big impact on us a lot, didn't it? I think became the democracy of participation. Mm -hmm. So it's like how many people have got a laptop, how many people have got a computer, right. how many people do this, and then it's well, hold on, people have got it on their phone, right? right? <clears throat> so so that's really transformed things. So again, with things like that, it's such early days right. that I'm in no way an expert, and, and very few people are. I know some businesses already set up in that space, but you know, I think you have to understand these things for a year or two at Correct. least Correct. to kind of begin to learn where it can fit in. There's some initial case studies and then, and then we tip into the sort of generative AI and right. chat GPT. Well, right. Where are the options? Where could it work? Even though there are lots of evidence now about issues, mm -hmm. so how can we learn from those issues and then introduce them to products that can 
to make it right. money, right? Right. Well, and, and I think, you know, and there's so many different directions that we can go here and, and please for the audience as well, feel free to kind of chime in with your questions. I mean, I, I've just got, I've got so many different places that I want to dive in with you. Um, so, so we're kind of talking about this concept that with each of these technology shifts, um, there's some reluctance, right? And, and that makes sense in the market research industry because the, the most important thing is, is my data actually valid? And can I compare it to what I did last year, right? And if I just change everything, then all of a sudden it's like, well, I can't compare. I don't know. Is this actually right? Is it not right? So when you kind of think back to these, these shifts, what was it that got people kind of over the over the edge of adoption, right? So if you think about like mobile surveys, you know, was it, okay, now we've done enough mobile plus paper surveys side by side to see that the data is the same on the mobile side. And so now that's cheaper, let's go there. Like what, what do people look for when they say, okay, it's time to actually adopt this thing now? So, so we're very evidence driven. So we would be looking at comparative studies. Yeah. So people are my time at Cantor, experts like uh, John Pulliston and people mm -hmm. like that in Cantor hell of a lot of research on research mm -hmm. really understanding the blood and guts of making a change right and what difference it makes because you know m mostly not everyone may agree but mostly if purchase intention questions yes with online in general to a broad consumer audience you get over the plate right right more people are going to say that's right you're going to purchase it you're going to purchase it yeah you know, to some extent, that's how you know advertising. To some extent, right. you, know, you you hope everyone who clicks your ad they're going to buy, right? But they're not going to buy. <laughs> so 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 there's a sort of understanding the bias right. data and understanding the outcomes in the data, so you can then say, and whatever those numbers are, you know, if it's, if it's I get thirty percent claim, I know from the data in individual individual markets because it changes right. by country, right? right? So you'll get some countries that can be more positive, some countries can be more neutral, some countries can be more negative right. about things. So understanding all of that and then learning from it and saying, okay, we can still ask purchase intent, but you know, we don't necessarily say immediately 30% of the UK Correct. population, which is Correct. one of my bugbears. So this is one of the things, if we could just stop as an industry talking about from our surveys, the UK population or right. the US population, this is a sample audience that's represented it Correct. based on some quotes and stuff. And, and I know from a PR perspective, that's a long sentence, so it's easy to right. say UK population. But, but yeah, so I think that that kind of evidence that we build up begins to tip people over. But right. price plays a part, right? Commercially, where we are now with, with the price of sample right. participants, right. You know, it is so low yep. that where else do you go? I do remember one of my early conversations with, with, with one of the team at Cantor. Um, where, where we were talking about hurrying things up. And if you think back to my early career where I was saying about right. you know, we had to print things off, we had to take them downstairs, they had to go on a bike and they had to go somewhere else. Yeah. You know, I, I'd ask people, you know, what, what, where's the tip, where does it tip to the point where you say we want this quicker or cheaper? Exactly. exactly. If, if, and and my, my uncle told me, I said, it, so if essentially before you've done the survey, if we give you the results yeah. and then we pay you to have the results, is that is that kind of the, the point you want to go to? And they said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. <laughs> well, it's actually one of those now, to some extent, having the results before you've even done the survey exactly. is, is kind of where we are now yeah. with some of this stuff, exactly with some of this stuff. You can use data that you've already got to mm -hmm. answer some of those questions. The price, I don't think, you know, research vendors are never going to pay clients to have their data. I think we're hoping that the clients are going to continue to pay for that data. But, you know, the price is very low. Yeah. Audiences, so. And that's, I mean, that's really, a, it's got to be a huge driving piece of it, right? Because if you look at, you know, again, you go back in age and you say, okay, coming from paper surveys to online sample, well, if that online sample is a fifth or a sixth of the cost of doing the online paper surveys and, or the, the in-person paper surveys, plus all the bikes and the distribution and scanning and everything else that comes into it, then it's just going to push people to evolve, right? And now even as low as sample costs are, Synthetic data is going to be cheaper. <laughs> it's going to be a fifth of the cost of, of yeah. sample. It may be a tenth, right? I mean, it's yeah, going to be yeah. a lot. And the speed is going to be yeah. amazing. So, so one of the important points here is then, then you kind of work out from the insights community. Right. You're then looking at, um, you know, how, how the, the industry bodies right. do this. And there is, there is certainly concern. Recent conference, we were both at in London, the ASC conference yep. in London in May. The whole thing around survey fraud right. and the challenges there, which is good. But we're now in a position where the global data quality right. um, 
uh, organization initiative has started with, with this brands like the SMR, mm -hmm. Market Research Society, the Insights Association, and others collaborating to say, you know, there is a general challenge right. now in data quality and we need as, as a group of bodies to work together right. to help solve this globally. Right. Because, you know, a lot of the stuff that we, you know, we've had in the past, I know you've worked in Canada and the US and stuff, I've been very UK focused. But, you know, research goes on in, you know, hundreds of countries, yeah. right? And yeah. it's not the same in each country. So we need to support that whole network with ways of managing data quality, whether it be within the actual context of the survey, yep. whether it's how the participants get to the survey, whether the participants are real, all these different parts of the ecosystem. Right. It's good to see the sort of data quality um, uh, organization get together now as a group yeah. and begin to just, and it isn't going to, isn't going to come up things overnight. It's a big question right. that we need to answer. Right. But we do need to have that stamp as an industry. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, you, you don't have anything that's back to your evidence-based stuff. You know, you need that evidence to say, this is why you do it. Right. This. this is why you use businesses as your experts in this. Yeah. Rather than, you know, perhaps a DIY approach or perhaps just picking up the latest data right. you can find from, you know, a social network or something. Right. Not that that isn't a valid piece of data to use as part of your insights plan. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So, Mike, tell us a little bit more about Greenberg Consultants. What are some of the things that you're kind of working on or thinking about these days? So... So when I set up in, in 2019, I, I looked across all that stuff we talked about mm -hmm. and decided my, my most recent work that I've done at Cantar is very much in, in, in what was classified as a tech-enabled, everything mm -hmm. tech-enabled. Mm -hmm. right? But this was looking at how tech could work beyond the way we were doing our standard surveys and our standard qualitative work. So how we could bring technology into different components, different ways of collecting data, perhaps different ways of analyzing data. So I decided to focus my consultancy business on that in 2019. Sadly, again, probably we haven't mentioned it for a week or two, the pandemic. <laughs> so as nice. I was getting things off the ground in 2020, human interaction became a challenge. Mm -hmm. And people fundamentally had you know, much bigger problems than, than me trying to set up my small business. So I kind of dialed things back to re kind of reset things in 2021 and started going out and talking about um, a sort of three-stage process. So my, my consultancy piece is around a discovery element. In most of the work we do, the discovery element. So a client may come to me and say, uh, we need a dashboard, which one should we choose? Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But usually there's a discovery element behind that of you know how they got to a point where they need a dashboard. Right. Um, so so I have a discovery phase where I'll try and unpick with, with in-person teams or on online calls or just looking through documents, unpick what the real needs are. Right. And and that could be part of a proposal system or that could even be a pre-proposal. And then I'll get into an evaluation piece that usually involves technology. Right. So it can be looking at, you know, what platforms are out there to mm -hmm. help us run our research with this question for being one. Right. There are a lot out there. Again, we're talking about Mike Stevens Insight Platforms. You know, go and search for survey platforms on there and you'll, you'll find a good few hundred survey platforms available. And then there's an implementation phase. So that's kind of the, the sort of three-stage process right. we're going to. And the last, I would say the last six months, the, the, the couple of things that have come up, and they're, they're sort of interconnected. Generative AI, everybody talks yeah. about. Very casual conversations touching on that. Understanding that generative AI is mostly about creative content. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not about mm -hmm. two plus two equals four. It's about creative content, right. understanding and creating some creative content out of that. Uh, but but most of the conversations this year have been led more probably by text analytics. Mm. So so you know again thinking about the early days of online and then the following five to ten years for me. So so 2000 2010, it became uh, a pattern that we began to take verbatim questions out of surveys mm -hmm. because you'd get your work done and then you'd spend another week analysing the verbatim outcomes. Right. And then you you'd be able to produce that into the report. So either you had two reports, one on the pre-coded answers um, and one on the, the, the coded answers, or you'd wait for the coded answers right. because you need your complete right. report. Um, that's changed. There's lots of platforms out there. There's now lots of tools within platforms that allow you to deal and manage with that data a lot better. So more of the conversations I've been having this, this year have been around either how we can deal with that within the survey, so how we can get open verbatim comments into a manageable format mm -hmm. so you can either review them uh, or deliver them to our clients uh, or, or text analytics in the bigger sense right. as in you know we've got two years of tracking data 
Um, one of the examples I remember, again, this goes back to Kandar days without mentioning anything specific, but, you know, we had a client who did a lot of regular kind of uh, innovation testing. For mm -hmm. you. Uh, but you're in innovation and uh, different product categories and things like that. But we took uh, 150, 200 different projects and, and pulled the text from the mm -hmm. pages up across that mm -hmm. and looked at that as, as a data set. Mm -hmm. So, again, from the client perspective, using data they've already paid for and collected, but trying to get some common themes right. coming around an innovation right. that might mean something to the brand rather than the individual product. Yeah. So conversations around that area, and then I know with question probably the insights up, it's like then how do we then actually have an ecosystem right. that helps us manage all that? And, and something like the insights hub and other other tools around there, you know, allow you to have that as a business where you can democratize it within your business. How, how you want to share right. it and who you want to share it with. Right. I and mean, this is like this is starting to become such a hot topic. You know, our our, our last fireside chat or, or two fireside chats ago was all about kind of our new Discover AI functionality that allows you to kind of do some of this open text analysis. Our actual next session is going to be with Sumer, who's all about emotional detection coming out of uh, the open-ended text. And I think we now are at this stage where you've got the technology that you should almost be having some open-end question in all of your quant surveys, right? Because it just gives you a data set that you can go back to that can help explain why, right? I thought that was such a great example where, you know, you're, you're going and helping these clients actually look at data that they already collected. Yeah. And saying, okay, how do we get smarter, right? And that's one of the amazing things about open text is that there's a lot hidden in there. Yeah. And you can probably keep on going back to that and mining insights and mining insights for years if you've got the right tools and technology. But I think we all look at it and say, well, there's 200,000 open end texts that somebody's got to read and categorize. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> and of course, in some cases, that can be audio and it can be video. Exactly. So you exactly. Convert, quite often those are converted to text. In fact, in most cases that I'm aware of, they usually end up being converted mm -hmm. to text and analyzed at that level. But analyzing video and analyzing audio is, I think, an area that's becoming a, a, a newer thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're there yet in the research spectrum. There may be some platforms and, and players out there who, who would uh, disagree that, and, and, and say this. But I think there's certainly a collection of that information right. and, and translating that into text and translating that into insights is there. I'm, I'm quite keen on seeing where the next, where we go next with, you know, really looking at video. Right. And really looking at those conversations right. where you've got a human involved in it, or perhaps a synthetic human, yep. and, and you're beginning to pick up body language. Yep. I mean, I'm, I'm all hands and things yep. like this. So picking up body language, you're getting intent and things like that from the commentary. Yep. I do remember again, um, and, and without revealing the client, but my time at Cantor, we were kind of doing some testing on, on video itself, right. giving people the opportunity. Yeah. And uh, we, we had, and I can't remember the amount of time it was in exactly, but I'm going to say about five, a five minute response yep. talking about biscuits. Oh my God. Because this person loved biscuits. Wow. And they, they wow. had, they had a lot to say. And, it, and, and, you know, we had comparative stuff where we would ask people to type or video. We never got that volume of information. And if you watch that five minute video, there were lots of pauses, right. there were lots of you know ums and ahs right. and thinking, and perhaps distractions of phone ringing or the dog barking. But <laughs> the, you know the passion about the pen yeah. was that you you know from the text. I mean, you might be able to read the passion, but just seeing this person, you knew this was a brand advocate. Kind yeah, of thing. exactly, exactly. And I mean, it's it's one of those things. It's like the old saying, right? A, a picture says a thousand words, right? And so you just get so much more from people. Um, and it's actually a little bit of a good pivot back to uh, Jake's question that was on the screen about data quality, right? That, hey, when you're actually capturing video images, like it's much harder to, to, to put in fraudulent responses, right? You know you, there's a real person on the other end. Um, I know this is an area that you've been thinking about a lot, right? And, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. So, so tell us a little bit, you know, I know Jake's asking about kind of the quality of panels. How do you think about that in this operations role, right? When you think about, okay, well, who's got the responsibility for data quality? Is it on the panel? Is it on the researcher? What do you look for, for from the panel to actually say, hey, there's good data quality there? And then what do you do on your end to, to actually make sure that you're getting high quality data too? Yeah, so so the short answer is is, is obviously a yes, Jake. The quality of panels, but, but the kind of idea of quality has to be something in, in terms of a, a measure. So getting some kind of uh, comparative stuff. Mm. So there are things like the, the SMR guidelines and the SMR 
questions. And I've forgotten the number we're up to now, 27 or 35 questions, where it discusses various, if you're a panel company, these are the things you need to abide by mm. if you're going to be part of the SMR framework. There's, there's, there's guidelines from the MRS, there's guidelines from the Insights Association on how you should manage, so, so understanding how the recruitment process works. Mm -hmm. That stuff should be published and that should be available. How individually different clients would judge uh, quality is, is a different thing. So, so some of that quality uh, can be, uh, it's not necessarily, I mean, a lot of the things we talked about at the Association Survey Computing Conference was, was around fraud. Right. So this is where people are deliberately trying to cheat the system. But poor quality survey design, poor quality experience on devices can produce what looks like poor quality data. Exactly. And that's not the, the participant. Exactly. It's the person who owns the survey. So one of the challenges, Jake, I'd, I'd probably say about the thing is, it's difficult to say where all that sits because a panel company will, would have the individual panel right. company. And don't forget that on your individual survey, it might not be one panel company. You could be using a, a route like Sint or something like that, where you get multiple panels coming into your survey. So each individual panel company has their own right. guidelines and data quality stuff. But within the survey, you can begin to do some basics around you know, controlling whether you want to do trap questions, mm -hmm. where you might ask a mm -hmm. person's right age range, and then you might ask something around you know, how old they are they talk, right. or you might ask them to type in uh, the number 25 on a screen just to make sure that they're paying attention. There is that. But, but you know, if we're at a point where we've got people into the survey and, and they're real people, if someone takes five or six surveys for a panel company and every time they go in, they get to, uh, they have to type in a number on a screen. Right. It's like, am I going to say engage with this panel? Do I have to do this every time? Is there not a measure within the system that could say I'm a valid person, mm -hmm. so I don't get asked this every right. time. But again, because you're coming across different providers of the survey, so the panel company doesn't necessarily provide the survey, the right. agency might provide the survey. So within the data held within the survey is the client and the research companies. The panel company doesn't own that data, so right. they can't use that measure. Right. You can pass information back and forward around validity. So you can pass information between the panel and the survey. So at the end of the survey, it's qualified, it's complete. You yeah. can provide additional information that we, we rate this person highly. So if you wanted to build that into your survey, you could do it. Right. And, it, and it's an interesting point, right? Is like when you think about data quality, there's almost two aspects to it. The, the first aspect is, are you who you say you are? Are you a real person, right? And in some ways, I think, you know, Jake is on, on the right track. It's like, that is the panel's responsibility. And there's gotta be some transparency around that. And there's gotta be some score around that. But, then there's this other side of the equation, which is that person is who they say they are, but are they giving you good data? Are they paying attention? Are they taking your questions seriously? Are they giving you something that's going to be useful at the end of the day? And I think that's harder to put the responsibility on the panel company. In some ways, you almost have to kind of think about how do you design your survey in order to actually keep people engaged and do these attention checks, right? Writing in those questions to say, hey, you said your age was this. Let's validate that. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the favorite ones that one of our clients always has is, you know, what's the what's the color of the purple strawberry, right? You know, yeah, yeah. They, are they reading the question, right? You know, we just talked about uh, open ends, right? And using that as a way or, or video uh, questions to make sure that somebody's paying attention and giving you authentic data. Um, so that's something we think about a lot, right? How do we build that into the system, build technology tools to do automated data checks, to work with our panel providers so that when somebody gets screened out on an attention check, that's not hurting your incidence rate, right? Yeah. Because they still are who they said they are, and the right? The price is going to be affected. And then the pricing is going to get affected. So we've actually gone and negotiated with the panel companies. Okay, we can send these kind of quality check back to you. It's not going to impact the the incidence rate, right? Yeah. Because you know you've got to have that feedback. Hey, this person wasn't wasn't really paying attention at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so lots to, lots to think about. And then obviously you, you put in synthetic data on top of that and you start to then have that kind of balancing act. It's like how much time are you spending focusing on making sure people are real and not fraudulent versus actually just going all the way to it's easier to have synthetic fake data yeah. because it's based on real data. And our industry, you know, it's big. There's a lot of money in it, but we're not as big as the global bank. Right. We're not as big as Amazon. Right. And you think about the amount of money they spend on dealing with fraud. And it's a gazillions amount more. Yeah. I don't know if that's a real number, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> gazillions amount more than our industry is as a whole. Right. 
on trying to deal with this. So we always have that counsel as much as we have to do our very utmost to keep our industry safe and keep it in a, in a, in a, in a viable product right. you know, for our clients. There is, there is a limit to what we can do. But if we understand those, those different components of it, and again, that collaboration between the larger uh, organizations, research businesses like the, you know, uh, the research networks like SMR, the MRS, the Insights Association, et cetera, collaborating more across that, getting you know agreed measures right so one of the conversations i've had recently is you know what, what would be the maximum interview length right you, know, you would want to put something right through. and 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 the answers generally are well actually if it's an engaging thing and it's presented to me in an interesting way and it's a topic i want to talk about like biscuits then i'll, I'll go on for an hour, hour. I'm ready. For an hour. <laughs> you know i'm happy but if it's something i'm less interested right. in, then that's going to be hard yeah. and then if the content is quite dry and it's not consumed in the way we like to consume things these days you know, you're going to struggle to get more than yeah. I think 10 minutes is a yeah. more top secret. And that, that comes down to the research, right? Are you writing an engaging survey, right? And, so, and some of that also comes down to the question types you're using and the way that you're kind of randomizing things, putting logic in there, um, because you can make a survey more fun. It doesn't have to be a boring thing, right? Not kind of gamify it. And then you're going to get better answers and people are going to be willing to sit there for 20, 30 minutes if it's gamified and they're learning something and they're moving things around or drawing on the screen or doing video instead of just single slide, <laughs> you know, matrix yeah. questions all day. And it, and it has, you know, people are interested in lots of different things. I, I do, again, thinking back to the early times when we began to utilize um, this atomic counter game, but let's use social data. You know, we'd ask questions of social data where you go, you know, someone would say to me, do you think, do you think I can learn anything from social data around in a business insurance on shipping and things like this and actually when i'm saying the broader sense of social data so you know search etc yes you can yeah. there's stuff out there because yeah. there is information and there will be people who want to talk about right. it admittedly there might not be 200 right. people in the north of england who yeah. want to talk about business shipping, but but you know there are people so yeah. as long as you've got a right design and a yeah. right methodology and you understand what your total audience is remember it's not a sense correct correct we're a sample correct then and I think, you know, you, you can kind of yeah. engage in stuff around anything, but you've, you've got to spend time on that and you've got to be a little bit careful about repeating it. Right. Because, the, you know, the, the, the gamification of things is great, yeah. I think, and can make things much more interesting when it's, when it's built and done successfully and right. well by, by, by experts. But I also think if you then repeat that 10 times, that perhaps becomes... Tricky, then it's not fun. Like yeah, like yeah, exactly. Yeah, so exactly. You've got so to, it's you've got constant to, innovation. The in idea of having, something. you know, if you have a newsletter, mm -hmm. issue one's always great, issue yeah. two is really hard. Yeah, exactly. Or the first <laughs> album, the second album, it's really hard. So, you know, you've got to have a plan, you've got to have the content coming all the time. Got it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, I, I do want to give uh, Jake's uh, last question and answer here, and then I think we're, we're probably out of time. Uh, but this is interesting because it kind of goes, you know, to your, to your point that, hey, this is... It's a sample, right? It's not a census. Yeah. Um, and so when we think about data quality, you know, one, can we do things to kind of get to that point that the banks are at in terms of fighting fraud and having that level of authentication? But then as almost like a follow-up, do we need to, right? So, 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 you know, in some ways, statistical significance, it's a, it's a sample, it's a survey, you know, can we accept two to 3% fraud a bank can't because it's very expensive. Yeah. But, you know, in the market research industry, is there a different level of acceptance? How do you think about getting to the banking standard in our so, industry? So, so per, very personal opinion here. So anything else I'm qualified or sitting in different committees and things, very personal opinion here. I, I, I lean on the side of, you know, I don't think 100% is yeah. going to be possible. Yeah. Because we just come across all the different elements of the process. We just haven't got the big enough investment. Right. To kind of make it 100 percent right. ready but going back to those early days you know we we had uh, people's home addresses so you had to give a home address <laughs> to be on a consumer access panel and your reward was sent to you yeah. at that home address so you know now that's less of an you know we want to know where you live but we want that from a qualification and and, and demographic point of view we don't send items to your home address kind right. of thing but you know that's another cost. Yeah. And if you were doing that, and we know how much people are exactly. mail and things like that. So, so you know. But if we want to get to a a more uh, rigid approach, right. then you know you have to think about how, you know if some you know some people take part says so they haven't got home address. Right. So what do you do about that? You know, and you want to include everybody. Exactly. You have a inclusive audience. Exactly. You want people answering questions. Exactly. So it's it's a complex area. So I I you know I feel at the moment 
you know, if we could get it down to where we, you know, if you, whatever you would classify right. fraud or where popular, if, it, if it's two, you get it down to two to three percent these yeah. days, I think you're doing quite well, particularly if you can more. get it during the life of the project where you can then say, okay, so I need 103% right. of my son right. because I know I'm going to find two to three percent. If you can do that, maybe that's where, you know, we can't yeah. sit at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Because so, I mean, it, it ends up being a cost benefit thing, right? Like to get to a hundred percent. Uh, as the banks would do, it's very expensive. And for the banks, it makes sense because there's, and there's a regulation. And there's a regulation, right? But at the end of the day, all of it comes back to human verification at the end of the day, right? So you can use algorithms to say, oh, maybe that person's not real, but then at some point, a human's got to verify them. Yeah. And then it becomes really, really expensive. And I think in this industry, we've got to keep pushing that forward. But you're right. I mean, 100% probably doesn't make, make sense to, to think about, it, especially with the expense that comes the with The goal it. and the ambition should be there. Yeah. So, you know, you have to kind of have those steps on the way that, right. that you know, at, at what point it's become commercially viable exactly. to operate a business in that. Exactly. I think if the business doesn't exist, then exactly. there's no question anywhere. Exactly. Okay. Makes sense. Mike, this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, everybody online who's joined us as well. Um, we've got an exciting episode coming next week um, with Sumer all talking about emotional detection, better sentiment analysis, categorization. So we're going to continue this theme a little bit as we go into the next few weeks. But again, thanks for joining us. And Mike, thanks for being here. Thank you. I see. Appreciate it. Good to see you in person. Good to see you. <laughs>